uh, regularly uh, about the demands on the service and the flow through the system and the capacity that we build. And I have to say, uh, I think the response <coughs> that has been made and is continued to be made by all partners working together, by uh, the organisations that you all lead, by the frontline uh, teams that work for you, uh, is continues to be remarkable and beyond all reasonable expectation that we could make. And um, I uh, acknowledge and thank folks for the terrific uh, work they continue to do, often beyond, as I say, uh, reasonable expectation, and for all of your leadership at this time. As a result of the of the um, how busy everything is, we're trying to maintain the regular flow of business. So meetings such as today's continue, but we're, tr we're trying to limit the amount of time that uh, we're asking people to commit. So I'm hoping that today in this one hour meeting, we can have a, a very, very uh, focused discussion on the on the key issues. It will feel a bit more like a, a briefing and less like a discussion than most of our meetings. Um, but if I could ask people to to, re to remain very focused on the core of the issues that we are considering, um, of course, it's important that all me board members can contribute uh, to the discussions and I will try and keep us on track and on time today. I have apologies from uh, Peter Armour, from Denise Park, from Jackie Hansen. We have a number of members uh, of the public and others who have registered to join in our meeting today. Uh, as always, you're very welcome indeed. Uh, please respect the protocols of having your microphones and cameras turned off and the fact that the, that the text column down the down the side is part of, of the meetings. Please resist any temptation that you might have to to join in uh, in that way. Uh, the meeting's been uh, recorded uh, for the purpose of the record and transcription this morning uh, as per usual. Since we last met uh, in November in this format, Clearly, just before Christmas, the announcement was made that the implementation date for the new arrangements, the establishment of the integrated care body and board um, and the formal uh, dissolution of the CCGs would be now on the, uh, the new world will start on the 1st of July as opposed to the 1st of April. This is a government decision. Um, we understand it and uh, we recognise that uh, the reasons for this, and it, but at the same time, we also recognise the extra demands this is putting on our current CCG governing bodies, the chairs, the accountable officers and members, and on the, the staff uh, continuing to work in the organisations. Um, it's not ideal, but uh, I'm uh, speaking to to all of the chairs to see how things look for us continuing to function with the statutory responsibilities in the CCGs for the first quarter of 22-23. And we will have a further discussion on that in the Strategic Commissioning Committee. Uh, later this week. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, support in making this uh, change happen and I also appreciate the commitment that everybody gives to continue working to the timelines that we've got established. That's what the expectations are uh, of us from, from NHS England Improvement and from the government that we will continue with full pace towards implementation. This should enable us to use the April to June period uh, in this year to operate the new world in shadow form prior to the statutory account, uh, responsibilities changing 
and uh, enable us to have a faster start from the 1st of July. So there we are, I'll crack on. Um, I've not received any new declarations uh, of interest or conflicts uh, notified to me. If there is anything, um, please raise your hand at the appropriate time and make the necessary declaration. With the minutes of our meeting from the 3rd of November, uh, in fact, at that time we were anticipating not all the details of the current uh, situation uh, and the levels of Omicron uh, pressure on the system, but we were we, we focused on uh, preparing for winter, the pressures, uh, increased access to primary care, all in the context of our financial position. So there's a real continuity from the items that we discussed in November into today's agenda. There's no specific matters arising for me to uh, highlight to you. Graham, do you want to say something before I ask for the minutes to be adopted? Yeah, it's just a matter of a slight, slight inaccuracy at uh, item seven, penultimate paragraph. You've got Graham Burgess sh shown as Councillor Graham Burgess. I believe he's representing the CCG and not the council. Thank you. Can I propose subject to the amendment that Graham raises that we adopt the minutes of the meeting, please? <coughs> Four thank you. That, yeah. thank, thank you, Roy. <coughs> Thanks, everybody. Right, let's move straight on. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of uh, brief messages for me, giving your introduction and um, perhaps just to uh, add to your message of thanks. Firstly, um, no surprise that we sort of frame this meeting with the context of, of our services under pressure. We're in the middle of the winter and we have a level four national incident uh, in place because of the pandemic. Um, so we we are reporting to you today. Um, continued pressures, uh, continued increase in the number of people in hospital, so obviously unwell to the point where, where hospital admission is required, but actually also able to say very clearly that there is a substantial team effort taking place across all of the partners represented here. A huge range of activity um, to respond in different ways, um, whether that's increasing vaccine rollout, supporting Colleagues prepared to move from their normal role to support frontline services, perhaps where there is staffing absence, um, surging capacity, so creating additional capacity in uh, hospitals or uh, community based settings. Um, and particularly this week, we have um, an additional initiative that we're working on, which we've 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 run before. We called it uh, Langs and South Cumbria together, but again, a way of setting a, a rhythm for the different partners to look at flow and discharge so that we're in a position to uh, ensure that people with a range of emergency conditions, including COVID, um, can access services when they need them. Um, so I, I really pay tribute to the, the effort that's going on. I'm proud to be part of the system at this particular stage in this way. The second message is linked in a sense, and it's that we are trying to make sure that we maintain and manage very clear communications to members of the public and to our communities. We have a set of clear plans and we're, we're updating uh, on those during the meeting today, and we're making sure that we try to explain what's happening and why it's happening on a daily and weekly basis. And some of that is about explaining COVID and our response to COVID, but some of it is about reminding people that NHS and local authority services remain open for them um, if they need access for other conditions or other concerns. And I think we just need to keep that balance, don't we, that we, we are here for people with a wide spectrum of, 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 of concerns or issues, and um, we have plans in place to address that. So with those messages, um, Chair, I will uh, hand back because clearly we're operating on a slightly different basis this morning. Thank you, Andrew. And let's go straight into item five, the winter situation report. Carl. Thank you very much. Um, so we provided to the board um, sort of regular updates on pressures across the system over recent months. Um, given the fast moving pace of change over the Christmas and New Year period, with the paper provides just a, a snapshot of how the look system was looking on the 4th of January. 
Um, clearly, it was this is out of date as soon as it was uh, sort of written, and many of the issues that have been highlighted in the report have been fixed uh, in the data since then. So, for example, the availability of lateral flow tests to primary care, and I'm sure that Caroline will want to update on the sort of mental health um, sort of position as well. So, <clears throat> as ever, we would expect that there'd be a, a sort of focus on the current position across partners in response to this item within the meeting. Um, what we really wanted to do was, get, given the shift back to the level four emergency footing, which happened after the board uh, meeting in December, we really wanted to focus the paper on how collectively we're managing the pressures in the system and how our actions compare to the national guidance that we received uh, just after the December sort of board meeting. We wanted to provide assurance to the board on how the system's working together to oversee and manage and deliver our response to the latest wave of COVID amidst continuing other sort of winter pressures. So, um, and again, our response to this is developed dynamically. So Andrew's already sort of mentioned the Langston of South Cumbria Together work, which isn't referenced in the paper, but came out of discussions of the joint cell about how we can enhance the effectiveness of the sort of system um, sort of response. So given time constraints, David, that was all I was going to say in support of the paper at this time. And I'll hand that back to you, but hopefully provides that detail to, to the board on how uh, how the system is uh, is working together in the challenges that we're uh, sort of currently on. Uh, thank you, Carl. It's a good paper. Uh, I'm just going to bounce around a number of colleagues for snapshots about how it looks and how it feels and um, what we expect to to happen over the over the immediate next few days. Uh, let me start. I'll go around some some of the provider chief executives first. Let me start with Caroline, then Aaron. Ben. Thanks, David. Thanks, Carl. Um, so yeah, as the um, as Carl has outlined in the report, um, really quite challenging. Really, really positive in terms of partners working together. Um, really great to see to see that. Uh, uh, in terms of our COVID position, we had a our highest spike before Christmas, a little bit earlier than our acute sector colleagues. Um, and I think part of that is the nature of the people that we're supporting and, and the more difficult um, areas of, of, of containing the virus, in, in particularly in an inpatient setting. Um, very high sickness um, and fragility, particularly over Christmas, but starting to get stronger now in terms of the independent sector. Um, but we have got risk in terms of people waiting um, to come into beds and also challenges in terms of right to reside. But really um, positive about next week and the um, the plan for LCT together. And of course, there's a whole transformation programme that is continuing bed expansion, community investment, etc. So overall um, fragile but um, a slight improving picture in some areas and uh, a lot of partnership working and uh, transformation focus. Thanks, Caroline. Go Aaron, then Kevin, then Martin. Thanks, Chair. So very similar feedback, uh, quite a pressured two weeks in particular, kind of from the back end of the Christmas break into, into last week. Uh, largely driven by two or three factors. So staff absence up at around the 14 to 15 percent mark last week, which just in context for board, that's, that's just over a thousand colleagues unavailable on any given day for, for shifts. Uh, some fantastic work by teams on covering and working in a different way to ensure flow through urgent care and, and admissions where needed. Um, and then occupancy, so the number of beds we have available on any given day to admit those patients coming through urgent care in particular, up towards that 98-99% level. And the big piece of work we're doing as a system this week on reducing those not meeting criteria to reside so we can improve flow is starting to have an impact. Um, the last couple of days we can start to see those figures come down slightly, which is really encouraging and it's helping in terms of flow. Um, took a decision in the Bay last week. Um, to use some of our facilities in a different way uh, at the Westland site where I am today in Kendall, just to try and, um, whilst the partnerships are working on improved flow for discharge, 
can we take some of those patients away from the Lancaster and Barrow site to improve the urgent care flow? And again, that's allowed us to step down some of that escalation this week. So there's a degree of stability at the moment, Chair, um, that's being borne out by partnership actions and some of the surge response we've put in place. There's a degree also of uncertainty, a little bit of the trajectories that we're seeing coming over the next seven to 10 days. So um, all hands on deck, we're still meeting every day as a leadership team, both within the trust and out with as partners, um, just to make sure all those surge plans are delivering as, as they should. Um, we're going to keep those plans really flexible meeting every day. So we are protecting those really urgent elective requirements, particularly cancer and the P1 and P2 patients as quick as we can move back to the recovery and restoration plan trajectories we had. We're going to keep flexible over the next few weeks so we can bring that back online as soon as possible. So um, a bit more stable this week than we were last week and lots of actions from the partners in the way that I've just described, David, just looking at the next week or two's trajectories and making sure that we're, um, we're well prepared across the partnership for what's coming. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Kevin, then Martin, Martin and then Trish. Thanks, David. And if, if you're okay, I'll respond from a systems perspective because it will um, build on what sort of Aaron and Caroline have said. So across Langston South Cumbria, we've got approximately um, 550 of our acute beds occupied by uh, COVID patients at this moment in time. Our ICU capacity is pressured, but it's holding its own. I think, as Aaron has alluded to, the, the issue that we're focused on is that the community infections are still going up. And we know there's a lag between community infections and that translates into activity on our acute site. So we can expect those numbers in terms of GNA beds to go up over the next couple of weeks. So we're not at the peak at this moment in time. So what we're doing as a system is, is, is working through all areas of capacity. So that means we're working really well across the system with um, community, primary care, social care colleagues, to really discharge safely and there's a real push nationally in terms of discharge that also means in, in terms of getting more capacity outside of our hospitals through the likes of the COVID virtual wards, the respiratory virtual wards. But what we've also done is looked across all of our acute providers and looked to see where we can identify additional capacity and this is about planning for the worst so if our community infections go up if that does translate into more admissions, we're going to need to have more internal capacity. So colleagues will be aware there's um, a Nightingale surge hub going up at the front of um, the Royal Preston site. It's virtually up now and complete, not quite, but it's virtually there. That will give us a maximum of 100 additional beds that we can use for surge capacity. And all of our sites have looked to see where we can open additional um, capacity. So an example being part of the canteen on the Royal Preston site we're using for um, additional bed capacity should it be necessary. Now, if we don't have to open this capacity and we don't use this capacity, that's a success for us, but we need to plan for it should those numbers translate into additional GNA bed capacity. We're working very tightly as a system, so we've got a joint cell, we've got our goal command that it's really ensuring if we need it, we're providing mutual aid between all of our partners. And we're now thinking about how do we manage the next couple of weeks and keep the system safe, and we will keep the system safe. There's a lot of pressure on our staff, so we need to think about how do we continue to support staff, and we're doing that everywhere we possibly can. And our minds are also turning to now how do we move out of this um, current phase of the pandemic and how do we restore our elective capacity and what we have done across Langston South Cumbria is try to maintain or as Aaron said all of our urgent work so what we'd call our P1s or P2 our cancers or emergency work what we've also maintained particularly on the Chorley and the Burnley site is some of our elective capacity for our routine work and it's important that we try and keep hold of that so we've not got um, greater backlogs to deal with once we come out of this current phase of the pandemic. So we're now planning for what that um, what that will look like for the future, but we are continuing across the system with as much of the elective capacity as we can hope for. So we're still not out of this current phase. It's very busy. It's difficult. It's pressurised for the staff, but we are coping and we will continue to cope. And I, what, um, just to back up what Andrew said at the beginning, all partners have worked incredibly well together 
and we were, we're only getting through this by that working and that systems working. Thanks, David. Thanks, Kerry. It's a great overview. Uh, Martin and Trish. Yeah, thanks, David. Very similar to what colleagues have said. Um, I think I'd start by saying the um, the letter we had from Amanda Doyle, 31st of December, given those six priority areas, um, it was quite pleasing that we had at least thought about those and discussed them and, and got a, a bit of a solution to them. So there was nothing left field in terms of those regional and national priorities. Certainly East Lanx, as, you, as you'd guess, seeing significant increase in COVID numbers, certainly over the last week. Um, they've actually gone by, down by 10 today, so I don't know whether that's a you know, sign of things to come, hopefully, but we've still got 160 patients in the hospital, as well as a, a really busy a &E through normal winter pressures. 761 ambulance attends last week. I think the next closest was 534, so you know, significant pressure on the general and acute beds. But as Kevin said, ICU is OK, only seven patients, so not like um, previous waves, really. Um, I actually think for East Lanks, we've done really well on the discharge ask, and that's testament to the you know, system, local system working and particularly community services. The pressure's more being the front end and the number of decision to admits that we're dealing with every day. So it's not, a, not about discharge and certainly we've had to put stuff in place around how acute medicine works with the emergency department to stop some you know, admissions, the admissions avoidance piece. As Kevin said, primarily because of the Burnley site, we've managed to keep electives more or less going, certainly the P1s, P2s and cancers, but very little elective activity has actually gone down. Um, and we just put a real emphasis on exec visibility and messages to staff, you know, doing daily briefings and, and weekly briefings. And morale has pretty much held up, which is you know, really important. Like Aaron said, we've been dealing between 10 and 13 percent sickness absence, but I've managed to safely staff through this period. So sim similar to what colleagues have said, David, thank you. Thanks, Martin and Trish. Yeah, so very, very briefly, just a, a very, a very similar picture here, the sort of capacity demand, um, the reduction in flow because the increase in Omicron and uh, staff absences just um, just all sort of came to a bit of a head last week. Um, but we continued with all our contingency plans um, in terms of our response. And I think really that's been the key in terms of a coordinated response in the system. Uh, um, a few uh, key focuses, first of all, was making sure that we could get staff testing turned around as quickly as possible to free as much of our workforce and offering those um, services across the patch to uh, to other organisations and their staff, not just keeping it all, all to ourselves. I think that's the key, really, that system working. Um, the virtual wards, we, we, we've had quite a lot of focus on that in terms of how can we keep people well and safe uh, outside of hospital and doing some partnership working there and uh, the uh, not meeting the criteria to reside obviously we had um, a key focus on that we're, we're not um, at the point we we would anticipate to be um, this week in terms of being able to move people safely out of the hospital setting but that's not for want of trying there's a real uh, rhythm going here with our assistant partners I'm about to go on a call after this with both CEOs of the, of the council just to sort of touch base with each other um, and see if there's anything else uh, that we, we we can do to uh, to support that really. Uh, just to touch on Martin's point really about the morale of staff, I think that's going to be the key. And um, every uh, every system in the country is experiencing these pressures. But I think for me, it, for this system, our perspective and how we work with each other is how we're going to be defined really. And uh, you know, from my perspective, that's just being exemplary from all uh, system partners. We're all human. We're all under pressure. And it's quite easy to sort of uh, start to feel those pressures. But uh, for the for the past week, that professionalism and just people being just full of um, that sort of will to uh, to want to help and support. And again, just to pick up on that recognition for staff uh, and doing as much as possible we can around engagement and recognition for staff that 
these are not normal circumstances so we're keeping them um, as supportive as, as we possibly can and sharing ideas actually uh, I think that's really important so uh, and nothing else to add really just a very similar situation David in terms of that demand in, in Blackpool. Thanks thank you very much uh, Jeff Jolliffe Peter Gregory. Hi yeah, good morning chair um, well there's a, it, it's always difficult to describe how primary care is going compared to how hospitals are going because there's more variation in individual providers. But I think there's a, a high degree of uh, common themes here. Um, the demand, of course, has been very high and it's not just COVID, it's, 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 it's a lot of other stuff as well. Um, so so uh, we are learning how to prioritise. We've been given permission to, to, to prioritise certain things and, and, and that's how people are working. Um, the major problem has been, uh, as said previously, is, is, is staff illness and staff shortages, both in clinical, non-clinical staff. Um, and one of the difficulties we have had is, is obtaining testing. But uh, fortunately, in Morecambe Bay, UHMBT have, been, have facilitated rapid testing to get staff back to work as soon as possible. So that's been great. We continue the vaccination programme. And, and if anything, we've got capacity in that. And it, it's a bit disappointing the public response because we've had a lot of capacity to do extra vaccination since before Christmas. And, and um, we've been literally pulling people off the street some days to come in and, and, and get the vaccination. So, so I'd urge the public to make use of that really important uh, pillar of, of managing this, this epidemic. Um, CCG, uh, we put on uh, extra support to primary care through our bronze, silver and gold scheme. And that's been really useful to support extra consultations for surgeries that are in trouble. And we have had a couple of surgeries that have run very close to not being able to open at all and operate. Uh, because of the staff shortages I've mentioned. Um, uh, so I think I think generally we're coping, but I think we, we mustn't kid ourselves that we're doing everything we should be doing because we are at capacity. So we're doing the most important and urgent stuff. Um, and, and, and inevitably there will be things that don't get done. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I, I, I won't duplicate too much what Jeff said. Uh, everything I agree with uh, um a couple of maybe little nuances I can add in. Um, the we know that as of Monday, abstinence rates amongst our staff were at thirteen percent. Um, however, four of that thirteen, four percent of that thirteen, are able to work at home, which which is helpful. It does seem to be largely admin staff that are affected. Um, when we look at the the practice, of the reporting significant pressure. Um, it does seem to have gone down a little bit this week. Um, conscious that may actually represent practices having had a little bit more time to implement contingency plans. So we can probably say at, at best um, it's improving, at worst it's it's stable. Um, the, the winter access fund schemes have definitely helped um, and as Jeff mentioned about the, the testing issues seem to be improving. Um, there was a rallying call by Dr Amanda Doyle and NHS England on Monday to the PCN clinical directors uh, to try to uh, see how primary care can support um, the, the discharge arrangements and reducing admissions and, and actually it was quite heartening to see despite the pressures that primary care is under and uh, there has been a, a positive reaction to that and, and some simple pragmatic and, and quick to implement uh, ideas have been are, are being worked on this week to try to get people out of hospital and keep them out of hospital um but overall um yeah it, it it's people are under 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 hard, hard pressure but it, it it's it's good to see how people are reacting positively thank you peter and to conclude this run round overview perspectives if i've gone to jane cass jane scattergood and andy curran Okay. Thank you, David. Nothing uh, more to add than, than what Kevin has already described in that um, it's incredibly pressured. The system partners um, are working really well together. More to do um, and the, uh, the modelling suggests that um, we've got a couple of weeks um, left of this as we reach the, the peak, so more to do, um, but, but nothing more to add than, than what partners have already said. Thanks, David. And Jay? Thank you, David. I, I think colleagues have described the system response um, for vaccines, maybe. Um, we are performing really well still. We've administered over 900,000 booster doses. 
And when the HSJ reports, it reports on whole population rather than eligible population, which makes us look a little bit uh, like we're not quite in the top 10%, which is where we like to be. Um, we've got quite a young population in some of our boroughs and they're not yet eligible. So when they report against whole population, we, we, our figures are skewed. We're now into the hard yards. Um, the good news is that there are still um, good numbers of people coming forward for first doses um, in the thousands rather than the tens or the hundreds, which is really good. We are now instructed to immunise the um, younger children if they're clinically vulnerable, 5 to 11s. We've, we've begun that work. 12 to 15s are due a second dose and now 16 and 17 year olds are getting their booster too. Um, we're in the hard yards in engaging with people. We are investing a huge amount of energy into outreach, um, easy to ignore communities. Um, and we learned from phase one and two that there are people who are not formally annotated as housebound because all those people have had an offer, but who are frightened of coming out and getting on the bus and they'll sit at home wanting to have a vaccine but not making themselves known to us or not having a method of making themselves known. So we've now got um, a, a method of accepting phone calls and, and emails from those people or their families and we'll go out and jab them. Um, and some more innovations, things like a drive through at Blackburn Rovers this week, which is doing modest numbers, but again, first doses. So the vaccine um, programme is compromised by staff absence. But because, as Jeff says, we're in the hard yards now in, in encouraging people to come forward, our capacity still exceeds demand. So we're in a good place. Thank well you. Done, Joe. And Andy, anything to add? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just a reflection, really, listening as we speak around the system of where we were at this time of last year and the year before, the collaborative working that's being displayed now. Um, we take for granted a lot of it. So, for example, as Kevin says about the critical care network, that just functions, there's system support for each other, whether it's Jeff looking for support from the acute trust, we're now displaying these behaviours that we've accepted in Langston South Cumbria as normal. And I think it's a real reflection on how we've come together, partly to fight the pandemic, but also our different ways of working, which bodes well for going on. Also to mention about COVID medicine delivery units, there's been an ask that's come through from the centre about stepping up and this is about treating our most vulnerable population who do contract COVID-19 in trying to prevent hospitalisation and subsequent ITU admission. We're moving into that phase where we're trying to prevent people from becoming ill, not only through the vaccination programme, but through other proactive treatments. And that will then take pressure off our acute services. So we're able to make sure that it's that collective working to deliver that. And so I think we just need to acknowledge whilst there's a lot of talk about how we come to live with this virus as a health economy, we are looking at how we do that as well as dealing with the consequences of it so that our winter plans are now about preventing people from becoming ill, not just through vaccination, but through other treatments and proactiveness as well. And it's really important for us to acknowledge that. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Andy. It's very important. And, and then local authority perspectives. Karen from Blackpool first, and then if I could ask Graham, Graham Gooch, if there's anything you'd like to add. Karen first. Th thank you, Chair. So uh, just to confirm our um, perception of our system working as being extremely strong and I think perhaps the strongest that it's ever been. So all of the local authorities are working both at LSC level and at local system level. Um, and we are obviously in co close contact with each other as well. Pressure on packages of care through care at home providers is a significant pressure and continues to be. However, we are seeing, we think, some green shoots of uh, capacity coming back in Blackpool, particularly aided by our holiday season finally ending on the 3rd of uh, January. Um, and we are seeing some mm. opening up cautiously of um, care home beds that have been battened down over the Christmas and New Year period. But we are all um, experiencing high levels of outbreak and our public health teams collectively with us are working to make sure that we are taking the right action and that we're freeing uh, places up from outbreak as soon as safely and reasonably uh, practicable. We've had a few hiccups with um, test results and test availability. We had mutual aid 
um, from the system, which worked brilliantly uh, in relation to that and uh, is testament to the working that we've got. Um, and we have been doing some additional work outside, uh, as, as one colleague said, prevention of admission is absolutely key, not just uh, the focus on discharge. So um, I guess that's the summary from Blackpool. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the File Coast authorities. Thanks, Karen. That's great. And Graham, anything that you would like to add? Yeah, so I was just going to say we're very keen to get help you get people out of hospital and, and, and into the care homes and also it'd be better if we could get them straight from hospital into their own homes. Um, but there is obviously a delay in getting assessments on that. That's the hard bit. As far as residential goes, we've got plenty of beds. It's the staff that we're, that, uh, we're lacking on um, because of sickness. Most of the outbreaks we've got in care homes are in fact staff being sick rather than uh, the residents, which, which we're very pleased about. Um, what we're doing, we're, we're advertising publicly now for get more people to come in and work in care homes, <clears throat> even just fairly untrained things, sympathetic people who come and sit with people with dementia to keep them company and that sort of thing, as well as people who can um, provide personal care and that sort of thing, and we're willing to train people. We're, we're not asking for volunteers, we're going to pay people for this. There'll be paid jobs and not that. Um, we've done things, we've had one, one care home going out of business um, through various business reasons. Um, so we've immediately recruit, recruited all their staff um, so we can then move on and put them where they're needed. But we're certainly doing all, all we can to keep it going. The systems are all working, but it's just a matter of getting the staff there to uh, keep it going. But we're doing our best to do that. Thanks, Graham. That's great. And the, the last word for Jack. Thank you, David. Just something that prompted me to, to respond was the um, an impending pressure within the NHS um, in the coming weeks around the mandated vaccination um, of NHS staff. Um, clearly, local authority um, and social care have gone through this already. So we're currently through the joint cell um, assessing the, the current impact of that and ensuring that we are providing as much information as possible to our NHS staff uh, for them to make an informed choice. But that could potentially cause um, some issues for the NHS as we move forward. Just a point to note, David. Thanks, Jane. And am I right that for any staff who were unvaccinated because of the st sequence of timing, if you don't have the fir first job by the 3rd of February, then you're not going to be able to complete the course in time the new legislation becomes active. Is that right? I think that's right, Jane. Is that nodding of head? head? Yes, it is. Yeah, and that's, that's Are correct. we actively reminding people about the dates? Yeah, OK. Kevin. I'm sorry, I was just going to say yes, David, but there's a very active programme working and trying to support all our staff in terms of encouraging them to have the vaccination. But ultimately, this is a national mandate. And so if staff are not vaccinated, they will not be able to work within uh, any patient facing areas, which really includes most areas in the NHS. And have we got a sense of how big this risk is in terms of the potential loss of people? I wouldn't want to quote any numbers at present. We're currently working through that with each of the HR departments, David. Each each, each organisation and each part of the system is working now and having one-to-one -one conversations with the staff involved. So we're collating those numbers as we speak. OK, thanks, Kevin. And uh, Karen? Um, so, so just to come back to say there is an impact for um, social care side as well. So we've done the residential sector to the extent that we're able. Um, the next uh, step is the registered care at home sector. So for domiciliary care, mm -hmm. which is where our current operational pressures are, the mandatory vaccination will newly apply to them. So we are working with that. There are nationally published figures from the tracker that show the progress with vaccination um, and with boosters. So the numbers are there. I don't know whether they cover acute trust because I only ever look at um, the local authority ones. Uh, I've got enough problems to deal with supporting that, but um, we are also on with it, but equally concerned about um, participation in mandatory vaccination and this looming first date, but we've raised it with providers. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, back to Jane. 
Thanks, David. Just to confirm, we, we did a lot of work when the mandation first came in for care homes and we took some councils um, anxiety from 12% of their workforce likely to not comply down to 3, 3.5% with some training and support. We've we've amended the training. Um, there are two training packs now available for line managers to support conversations with their staff and a session directly for staff, which is being led by the vaccination programme. We're linked into all HRDs and directors of nursing, etc., in the trust so that they can get their staff in front of the quest live question and answers, hopefully have their anxieties assuaged and, and get consent rather than any difficult decisions down the road. Thanks, Joe. And Derek, uh, Cumbria County, you just have you got something to add, please? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, um, just on the general winter pressures updates. I mean, the, we we were in a broadly similar situation to everyone else. Uh, we have a particular situation where this is across Cumbria rather than just South Cumbria. Uh, two thirds of our uh, homes are an outbreak, which is causing um, significant issues in terms of uh, safe discharge. In terms of vaccinations, uh, you know, similar to, to, to elsewhere, we're working through this with uh, the community um, social care staff uh, in domiciliary care, but also personal assistance as well if they're CQC registered. Um, and we are, there is a significant um, uh, concern there, I think, for us going forward, where we're looking at uh, probably something in the region of 10, 15% of staff have not been um, double vac vaccinated at this point in time. We did a lot of work uh, around the residential care and we're expanding that out uh, more widely uh, uh, now, but that is a, a, a potentially quite a large impact mm. on, on, um, on the market, especially as it is not evenly distributed. So there are some providers who will be worse affected than others. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 and that may have an impact on their ongoing sustainability, which is in some areas quite fragile to start off with. So uh, that's where we are. Thank you. And Roy. Thanks, uh, Chair. <clears throat> um, are we also assured that our private providers and our hospices are, are also uh, in a similar position to uh, our NHS colleagues? Thanks. Jane, so the, the vaccination as a condition of deployment mandate applies to every regulated care activity. So anything that's CQC um, registered um, and the offer is the same, Roy, um, for the training and support for sure to the independent sector and to um, hospices and others um, that they, they face a similar situation and, and we're putting all the support in that we can. Thanks, Jane. OK, well, thank you, everybody. I thought it was important that we got a full picture uh, of of how it is across all our sectors and all parts of the patch. Um, again, the, the efforts that people are making are, are outstanding. Um, there are risks, as we've just been discussing. There are, uh, we have an, an obvious uh, a concern or an anxiety about quite what comes next, but uh, it's very clear from the way that you've all described what's going on that um, the system is coming to work together uh, as effectively as we possibly can and I don't sense any lack of uh, willingness to support each other or to uh, work in a very integrated way and I think we can we can take uh, confidence and encouragement from that as we face the next stage of the challenge. Is, is, Carl, is there anything else that you need to add before I move on? No, nothing further. Thank you, David. Thanks, Carl. Right, let's um, shoot quickly through some of the other updates. Uh, Sam, the money. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just I'll give a brief update of what the paper's saying. So the paper's there and it gives you the detail. I think at our last formal meeting, it was at the beginning of November, and I think we were submitting the plan for H2 at that time. And I'm pleased to say we did submit a, a balanced plan. And so this report shows how we're performing against that at, at the end of November. And uh, what the report is showing is that we are meeting that plan um, and we are slightly ahead by about 1.3 million. And we're forecasting to still meet the plan at the end of, end of the financial year. 
there are risks in there that are being managed uh, and there's a big focus on that. So despite what's happening at the moment in our environment, there is still an ongoing um, scrutiny and work going on behind the scenes and across the trust and, and CCGs with the finances with people working together. So um, when we did submit the plan, there was a lot of um, efficiency plans that had been, that were unidentified around 40 million. That's come down to about 26 million now. So things are improving and, and they are being identified. The run rate, um, when we originally looked to submit the plan for the second part of the year, we did um, see a, a potential run rate uh, that was going to sort of exceed a, 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 the, the available resource and, and shoot through the roof. What's actually happening is that's remaining fairly stable. There's been a slight increase, but it, it's staying fairly stable and not going up massively. So that's, that's positive. Um, but I suppose the, 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 the consideration that we have in there is how much of all of this is being done non-recurrently. So there's a lot of work to turn the non-recurrent work that we're doing across the system into recurrent plans. And it's really important that all organisations are working on their recurrent plans um, and, and the system-wide schemes are being put in place for the future. So... Um, we are making sure we're keeping track of all the expenditure that's relating to the um, uh, Level 4 incident, making sure that we're keeping track of that and we're in discussions with the regional office and national team about how, that, how we can continue to be supported with some of that as we move forward. Um, just in terms of the assurance around this for the board and for uh, just to, to, so I, I can be clear around this, is that we have... Uh, a monthly meeting now that is very focused on all the mitigations of risk in the plan, that, that there are leads in place around that. We're meeting monthly to focus on that, but we all, I'm also personally holding one-to-one -one meetings with each of the directors of the finance to understand the recurrent, non-recurrent position, where their run rates are, and how we're sort of moving towards the end of the year. So I suppose they're the key messages in there, and um, I'm happy if there are any questions, but I'm also conscious that we don't have a lot of time. But I think that the, the, the message is fairly positive in terms of where we've got to, but we've got to keep the attention on the recurrent, on the recurrent nature of the plans that we've got. Thanks, Sam. Graham? Yeah, I think um, there's some very good work going on, and thanks to everybody involved in that. Um, my only question is that um, I'm wondering when will we get to have a discussion about how we allocate any savings needed for next year? I mean, Sam mentioned next year. Obviously, currently the whole the whole uh, need for um, uh, one-off savings and savings being made in maybe a, a rather ad hoc manner. Um, well, I do wonder, will we have a report sometime in the next month or so about what's the criteria and what the priorities and what areas we will be protecting and what areas we'll be focusing on in terms of saving, so this board can have uh, some say about a more strategic approach to next year's um, finances. Thank you. Okay. That, that leads us into the next agenda item quite nicely, really. Just hold on to that for a second, um, Sam. Is there any yeah. any other points of clarification needed on the finance position? 11 weeks to go in the year, we'll take cautious optimism at this stage, but we, we, we need to keep a good focus on inevitably on this is in the midst of everything else that's going on as well. But I'll just lead us straight in then, uh, Sam and Carl, into the planning process for next year and, and pick up the point that Graham's raised, please. Yes, I will do. Yes, thank you. Um, so the planning guidance was actually published for 22-23 uh, on Christmas Eve. Um, as it as it normally is, uh, and uh, the timelines have moved back slightly. So what we've now what we're now looking into is having a draft plan for the next year by mid March, and then a final by the end of end of April. So we're still awaiting um, some of the technical guidance behind it, but we have got quite a lot of information which I've put into the report. Um, the um, the plan really focuses on 10 key areas, which are detailed in diagram one. I'm not going to go through them, but they are there and they're the things you'd expect to see. Uh, and although it, what I'm describing in the in the paper is a year one revenue position, we are expecting in the later in, in the next iteration of information coming out three year revenue allocation. So that will give us a, a real ability to be able to plan. And I will come back to Graham's point in a moment, but certainly that enables us to have a more longer, you know, a, a more opportunity to look at a longer term um, plan around those allocation savings and how we how we move forward. We do already have the three year capital allocation. 
allocation. So that's good. So our allocation for the system is 3.2 billion plus another almost 300 million around for primary care. Uh, and the running costs for the ICB at 32 million. So they're all described in the paper. So you know, we're looking at around three and a half billion in terms, in terms of that funding. Other primary um, care services and specialist commissioning are outside of that, and they are still held with NHCI at this stage. There are plans for specialist commissioning to be allocated down in, in future years. The way the allocations have been provided to us is basically on the H2 position that we've had um, last year, or this the year that we're in currently, times two, which is actually based, as we know, on historic costs. So for us, that is a better position than going back to the historical allocations, but it does reflect a cost base or an allocation now which is above about 7.7% above our fair shares allocation. So what that's actually meaning for us is there will be a, uh, there is an expectation next year to have a 1.1% efficiency built into the plans. But because we are above target uh, for our fair shares, we are looking at a further 1.1%, so a 2.2% efficiency. What's also been described in the in the plan is um, is a move to reduce COVID costs. Um, of the COVID allocation that we've received this year by 57%. But what they've made clear on that is that that will be reviewed as we go forward because we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty, as we know, given where we are now, about how, how achievable that could be. So, But what is important is that we understand those costs and we understand how they can be um, scaled down uh, as we move out, out of the pan pandemic. Um, it will be up to the ICB how we make allocations um, after receiving that allocation, how we do that uh, across the system. And there's a lot of work going on in the background around uh, working out sort of that financial framework. But it will be important and it's been sort of supported nationally and regionally about an approach to try and keep things as straightforward and simple as we move through the transitional year, which will be 22-23, uh, to really work and develop that in, in more detail. The paper describes um, the set of SDF funding around 52 million. You can see that is there's some, some, some big funding in there around uh, mental health and primary care particularly, but it's all listed in there. They're draft at this stage, but they are there for your information. And you can see that the capital allocation is around 112 million at CDAL, plus some specific areas for um, diagnostics and, and IT. There's a, a, an amount being held regionally um, for um, elective uh, capital, which will be subject to discussions with regional teams. So I, I think that sort of summarises it all. But the way that we need to we need to sort of move forward, coming back to Graham's point, is that we absolutely need to be looking now at. I mentioned earlier about finding the recurrent solutions to this year's um, non-recurrent action, which we will do, um, and we need to be working on that. But what's really important is that the system-wide diagnostic work that we've done and the priorities and the plans that are coming out of that, we're working hard to look at a tra more of a transformational approach to that, linking into our clinical strategy and our overarching strategy. So it's really important that we, we put those together so that we hit the floor running when we get to the new, new year, because uh, if any non-recurrent um, sort of uh, costs that may fall out of this year, plus a 2.2% efficiency requirement and a, coming, and a plan to come out of a pandemic is a big ask if we haven't got really clear plans. And it's absolutely right and proper that we bring back those plans uh, for wider engagement and discussion to this to this meeting and and we are we are doing that we're working those up but they will be very much um addressing some of the things that we know uh, are coming out of the diagnostic work that we've been doing to sort of um to, to look at sort of driving some of those efficiencies out so I'm, I'm happy if there are any questions on that but um i'm also conscious of time as well so thanks uh, sam anything you want to add carl it was just to say that the latter part of the um, paper um, summarises the discussion that we had with system leaders ex executive in December about how we manage the um, the planning process. Clearly, that those operational plans for next year, those are going to be the very first system plans for the ICB, and they're going to form the foundation of the development during the next 12 months of a um, health and care um, strategy. For, for the next uh, for, for the next five years, so it's really important that during the transition, we ensure that all partners are engaged in the development of, of robust operational plans. So that the, the paper sets out the approach that we're taking around ensuring there's strong system leadership 
to ensure that there's overarching strategy and direction and that the provider collaborators can uh, play an enhanced role in coordinating the sort of provider response and that place-based partnerships and other <clears throat> for, for local vertical integration. So it's really just to, to seek um, support of the, of the board in terms of the, how we plan to manage that process. That's fine. And we'll get a more comprehensive, hopefully some of the heat that we're feeling in the system now will have eased a bit and we can have a more reflective and considered discussion on this at next month's meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. Andrew, system reform update. Thank you, Chair. So regular update. Um, it confirms um, your earlier introduction about a change in the national timeline for the new statutory arrangements um, to the 1st of July of this year, and that will allow uh, some additional time for the legislation to progress. Um, we have a broad consensus across our system that we are going to continue to work as much as possible to achieve the plans that we'd set out earlier and have been previously reported to the board. Um, we will obviously use the collective arrangements that we already have in place, including the Strategic Commissioning Committee, the Provider Collaboration Board, those groups that enable us to take decisions together. Um, but obviously we'll be looking at our plans again in the light of refreshed um, this refreshed timeline and any additional guidance that we might expect. Um, I just wanted to highlight, uh, board members in the past have done that, we have a, an ongoing concern to make sure we communicate clearly with staff who may be concerned about this potential delay. So that's an obvious area of focus and we'll be taking action on that in the next fortnight. I'm happy to take any questions. Graham. Silent Graham. Sorry, so, sorry to hold the debate. Um, I'll probably be raising this more um, at the Strategic Commission Committee tomorrow, but I do think the ICS, uh, ICSB boards go a broad responsibility. I do think we really now to be thinking about centralising more functions uh, from CCGs, as I think CCGs are becoming um, very um, fragile um, and certainly will become more so, particularly in, in respect of staffing. I think staffing um, needs to be uh, addressed. So. To, certainly tomorrow at the SCCC, I'll be pushing that um, we look at some form of either enhanced uh, responsibilities for the SCC um, to give them more powers to bring um, um, decisions to the centre to relieve the need for CCGs to carry out um, all, all their functions with all their staff who are under a, a, a lot of pressure and uncertainty at the moment. So I'll leave it there, Chair, but I thought I'd just give notice of that now. Yeah, it's very hot. Thank you, Graham. Point taken. Mike. Can't hear Mike. I'd say that for a future discussion, it would be interesting to hear how all this is panning out at the community level, uh, because obviously, run rightly, we look at it from a high view, but how is it working out at the grassroots is, a, I think, a crucial issue, and maybe there's a chance to discuss that in the future. Thank you. Point. Yeah, very well. Maybe do we take that for our next discussion? Right. Thanks, uh, Andrew and colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> I've not been notified of any items of any other business. We meet again informally on the 2nd of March. Uh, we keep under review at the, the meeting, uh, time allocated to the meetings, recognising everything else everybody has to do. I'm sorry that you know with nearly 40 of us in the meeting there's not been the opportunity to have as much discussion today or to bring everybody in but I appreciate people's support with that and the need to, to move on and, um, and, and get back on top of the of the issues that you're all managing uh, very well at the moment. So thank you very much indeed and see you again on the 2nd of March. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jim. Bye bye.